سلام بچه ها <laughs> سلام بچه ها وگن هلو کلا هلو تایفون وگن بچه ها تو دیس مانده ستریم او فلاس بلو ماست سیمور وگن از میسی او سو مچ ام بری هاپی for you all to be here and you know hello video this you know the drill confirmation that you can hear me confirmation that you can see me and the video is not bumpy or anything just confirmation of everything and as you are typing how are you butcha how is this week started because my god have i got a monday what a monday <laughs> it's been let me tell you butcha it's been absolutely everything there's, there's been absolutely a piece of everything in this monday it's like it's a chaotic day nothing nothing could fit we could try to fit something else in this monday but we'll fail miserably because it's just packed it's just full of things <laughs> so yeah if you could please give me confirmation that everything's good and you can hear me and see me just get the ball rolling yep everything works fine Don't don't ask me about this. This not this is not my attempt of dressing up as a fortune teller because we're going to talk magic here. This this is because I love this handkerchief I showed you before is from a dear friend of mine who lives in Tokyo and I do not use it quite often so I thought why not. And then it turns out that I look like a again like a discounted fortune teller or like the character the the character from medieval which is a gypsy fortune teller. Apparently not many people got that reference last time but so throw it there. It's like that that woman that woman was a fine character ah oh, yeah yeah so yeah all good to start well i cannot start without thanking so much to all my people there thank you so much to everyone to follow and subscribe to the channel my god we are over 200 now and i, I just i just don't know what to say where did you all come from it's been it's been mind-blowing and overwhelmed thank you so much Thank you for clicking follow and thank you for subscribing to the channel. You help me a lot. And of course, I could not pass without mentioning my generous patrons. Thank you so much, guys, because with your help, I can keep going and I can bring you streams as nice as this one. I'm so excited about today's topic. But the truth is that this one has been a little bit costlier because, um, you know, sometimes the topics I touch upon are very interesting, but they're a little bit difficult to research about because yeah research is not always that easy but i've done my best and thanks to my patrons i could dedicate a little bit extra time um to this so i am thrilled i am very very happy uh yeah we're gonna we're gonna speak about fine we're gonna speak about something i actually work with this is my this is my professional field more or less i will dig as we dig deeper i will tell you more details about that but yes i am so so excited genuinely excited Let's move on to the tea, shall we? Are you guys drinking tea with me? Typhoon, are you there? Because I saw you. Yes. Is Typhoon drinking tea as I expect her to be? Is Viridis drinking tea as I expect her to be? Is Claire drinking possibly Diet Coke? But that is okay too. So. Okay, I like it. I wasn't sure about this one because, because, hold on there. This one is called, I love, you know, I love these names. I love these kind of names. If everything fails me in life, I'm just gonna go dedicate naming teas. This one is called Honeycomb Cookie Dough, like like dough, spelled like in The Simpsons. And uh, of course, you're drinking tea with these. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Um, and because it says honeycomb, I was a little bit unsure because I am not the biggest fan of honey in this world. Yes, oh saffron tea. <gasps> Saffron tea, that makes me, back, brings back so many memories from Iran. I want to go back to Iran. <laughs> back to the tea. I get distracted. I could spend hours talking with you, but um, so uh, it says honeycomb dough, uh, cookie dough. Um, I wasn't sure because I'm not the biggest fan of honey, but then I read that it has rooibos, which is fine because my heart enjoys rooibos from time to time. Uh, cocoa nips, Sri Lankan black tea, which if you know me the slightest, you know, it is always a win because yes, yes to Sri Lankan black tea and yes to black tea in general. And um, puffed quinoa, yes, this tea has quinoa in it. And uh, oat flowering tops and stevia. So I was a little bit unsure because uh, if you, you heard me saying this before, I'm not a big fan of sweet teas and sweet things but actually it smells like it doesn't have any honey in it which i appreciate and um yeah it's just taste it's just another taste test oh my god i want to go back to iran too 
I know soon Typhoon will be able to come back soon. I am I'm hopeful. Yes. To Iran and to everywhere in the world. Soon we'll be able to travel again. Soon these two shall pass. We're gonna read about it today. I actually know. Okay, though. Hmm. It's it's quite nice. You can smell the cocoa on it. Yeah. I mean, I like it. I like it. It's, it tastes as much like a rooibos, like vanilla-ish rooibos. How do you pronounce it? Rooibos? Rooibos? Ro Roy <laughs> <Blah, blah, blah. laughs> Twist it over there. I have no idea. Oh, we have the sun. Here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. So, uh, what was I saying? I completely lost it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I have to make a disclaimer to myself. As, as I was saying before, I am no fortune teller whatsoever. And what we are going to cover today doesn't imply that I can actually read your future or do any kind of reading with supernatural powers. I lack them. My supernatural powers are just oriented towards creating chaos and dealing with, with demons. But I cannot read your future actually and we are, we won't be doing that today. I'm gonna explain to you how fortune teller, um, how fortune telling, sorry, worked back in the day, but today we are not gonna read anybody's future because to start, I would need to have you guys here with me and the book, super expensive i cannot afford it yet <laughs> maybe one day and you will need to open it for me so no i'm afraid we're not going to cover any kind of fortune telling today so ah yeah i'm just uh, i'm just very very excited and uh well without further ado let's dive into it shall we so yeah butcher welcome to this live stream i am thrilled to be here with you this has to be one of my favorite topics ever if we are talking about the fall no man is because my patrons decided so so you can also vote for coming topics if you support me on patreon i invite you to visit patreon slash las plumas de simul and take a look maybe you'd like to give us a hand and join the family which keeps growing and for that i am extremely grateful if this is the first time you come across this twitch channel what is it we're doing here hello my name is laura although recently my name is being changed hello my name is plumas which means feathers in spanish and what we do here is we talk about history about art about books and about magic and this is precisely what we're gonna do today so yeah as i was saying what we will be covering here is the fall nome which is a book of omen a book of prophecy, a book of divination. We're going to cover a specific time span, which is the 16th century and the 17th century. And even though some mentions to the Ottoman Empire are going to be made, we'll focus mainly on Iran. We're going to talk about Iran mainly. At this moment, the political context is uh, as follows. The ruling dynasty in uh, Iran are the Safavids and the Ottomans rule over Istanbul in Turkey. This is more or less how the general landscape looks like. Um, but first, I'm gonna have to take a sip of my tea. I love doing tea pauses, like dramatic, dramatic. I pretend I'm dramatic. I am by no means dramatic, but I like making tea pauses before jumping into it. I like this one. I do. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I actually price on that, but yeah, of course I do. So. First, we need to make a little introduction on bibliomancy. What's that exactly? What is bibliomancy? Well, bibliomancy is the art of divination through text or extendedly with books. And many stories and anecdotes we have from Iran attest its popularity in the Islamic world. And for this activity, many books could be used. The Quran, the Divan of Hafez, the Mosnavi from Molana, or also called Rumi, and why do people do that? What's the purpose of bibliomancy? Well, to know. To peek into the future and know what's to come, confirmed by a series of supernatural powers that normally were connected to God in this case, as we are talking about the Islamic world. 
The purpose of bibliomancy was to offer insight into the world of the unseen, al-ghaib in Arabic, that what we cannot see with our mortal eyes. The outcome of these magical practices would guide the seekers in their actions and interests and assure them their successes and warn them from any dangers or disasters ahead. So in this tradition of using books to gaze into the future, if I could gaze into the future, future... <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> In this tradition of using books to gaze into the future is where the Fal Nome books appear into. The particularity of the Fal Nome is that they rely on painted images for pronostication and that was quite a change. Because what was used before the Fal Nome, I said we will be covering from the 15th to the 15th, I'm lying, 16th, 17th century, I said we'll call it that, but what, what was used before? Well, Surprise, surprise, uh, the book that has served as the most important text for divination since the Umayyad, that is around from around the 7th century, was, that's right, the Holy Quran. Although it is important to know that this practice of divination through the Quran was condemned intermittently. Depending on the moment we are dealing with, it was either forbidden or not specifically condemned. It was not always illegal, but also it was not always legal. However, the practitioners came up with a series of listed methods for consulting the Qur'an and found their way around restrictions and thus these methods were adapted and modified for other texts in the future. But sure, uh, this only speaks about how extremely popular bibliomancy and divination practices were, not only from the 16th and 17th centuries but before, even before the establishment of Islam as a religion. Now I think that is fantastic. Among the techniques considered acceptable, there was the istikhara. Istikhara comes from the Arabic root kh, i, ar, like r, which implies choice or option, but also includes the idea of entrusting God with this selection and submitting to his will. This way is not really the person making a choice, but seeking advice from God themselves. Even the Prophet Muhammad practiced istikhara. This istikhara was allowed, but ta'awul, which literally means divination, was strictly, strictly forbidden and condemned. And why was that? Well, because fal, the Persian word for omen, fa'al in Arabic, implies consulting a text with hopes to seek for an augury or to, like, for peeking into the future. And that kind of power, that kind of information, only corresponds to God. But with istikhara, we were good, and around the 15th century, the practice of performing divination through the Qur'an was formalized and codified in special tables, the proto namas And because Bachar Amanat historian, we are going to see a lot of beautiful images today, starting from these falnamas, these proto namas There you have it. This is what a falname attached to a Qur'an would look like. This is in fact from a Quran from Istanbul, it's an Ottoman Quran from 1503, if I'm not mistaken. So, these early Falnames appeared at the end of the Quran and they became extremely popular in Iran and in Ottoman Turkey. Most of them were written in verse and richly illuminated, and of course, they came with instructions too. So, how is it we use these tables? First things first, ritual ablutions must be performed. To cleanse both body and soul. Then you have to get yourself a complete version of the Quran and recite the Fatiha. Can you guys see me? I mean, is, is everything still okay? Because I think it is, but I could be mistaken. Mm. So yeah. After you get yourself a complete version of the Quran, you need to recite all good, fantastic. You need to recite the Fatiha. And I'm going to make a quick break here to explain that the Fatiha is the opening verse of the Quran. And I am not going to recite it because I want to make it justice to its beautiful sound. And also because I don't know Arabic, but I'm sorry for that. But go check it out some other time should you be interested. It's beautiful. 
And as I was saying, you make the ablutions, you get yourself uh, your Quran, you recite the Fatiha, and later you recite some of the surahs or verses to be protected. And then, and only then, you can start asking for guidance. You open the volume randomly, and whichever word you lay eyes upon first, that would be the answer. That is your augury. Eventually, the Fat Nermes started to become more and more complex, adding numerical calculations and all sorts of charts and tables that were difficult to navigate. And finally, they became independent of the Quran and their own volumes. But let me tell you, the mathematical calculations needed to work with these Fat Nermes was complicated. One one must have a very good brain or at least a very nice calculator close to them to have a sort of specific and accurate algorithm. It was difficult. I've been trying to kind of figure it out myself and I couldn't, I could, I'm not that good with maths anyway, but you know what I mean. Uh, that is uh, with the relation, in relation to the Quran, sorry, but I said that all the books could be used as well. Now, didn't I? Yes, indeed. Another volume that was super popular and still is, let me tell you, is a Divan from Hafez. Hafez is a very famous Persian poet, considered one of the fathers of modern Persian, although he lived in the 15th century. And um, yeah, it is, uh, this Divan is the most popular literature book used for bibliomancy, a book that is not linked to any kind of sacred context. Like when using the Quran, you have to recite the prescribed blessings before diving into it and then open the book randomly. And here we have two options. The augury is either the first verse you lay eyes upon or the verse at the bottom of the page. The practice has evolved and nowadays the Iranians still use Hafez during the night of Yalda, Shabe Yalda, which is the winter solstice and the longest night of the year. And they use Hafez, they still use the Divan of Hafez for divination activities, but it's not exactly done as it was in the 16th century. Some things have changed. So, T. So, gathering up all this information, one of the earliest conclusions we can make is that bibliomancy must have been extremely popular in Iran. Extremely during the 14th century at least, but I personally believe this kind of activity was continued throughout the centuries, and that is why its legacy is so strong by the time the Safavids arrive, because if not, if it's, it was not popular, you don't have rules over there, you know, prohibited, you know, condemned, you know, you know what I mean? This activity was have been such an important part of their daily lives, asking for auguries from the Quran, uh, from the Divan Hafez, from the Mas, uh, Masnavi, from Molana, all of these activities and all these people should be like so entangled together in this society. It makes me, oh, it makes me shiver. It makes me happy. Yes, indeed. Mm. So, we're gonna go now. We're gonna speak a little bit about divination with images because we spoke about divination um, with text, but what happens like with the Fal Nome is an illustrated book. So, at least by the first half of the 16th century, consulting large-scale images was also very popular divination practice in Iran and in Turkey. The images would be separated in this case, painted pieces of paper that would be displayed in front of the costumer or seeker, and then the augury would be revealed. We have many accounts of eyewitnesses of divinatory practices, so that points out two things again that first, that the sessions were not private whatsoever. Everybody could see, everybody could attend a divination session. And two, that the images were separated pieces of paper. They were not compiled in a book, rather mm, kept in a folder, sort of a folder. I don't know if there were folders in the 16th century Turkey or the 16th century Iran. I don't think so, but you know what I mean. A box <laughs> somewhere. Um, Something very interesting happens in the in the 16th century, during the 16th century, that is the occult, that al-ghai, but we cannot see the unseen, experiments a new wave of interest during the time of the Safavids, and so did the illustrated works that covered more or less the same topics. The earliest book 
combining illustrations and auguries was the Munis al Ahrar fi Dalaiq al Ashrar. That was difficult. <laughs> which means The Free Man's Companion to the Subtleties of Poems. That is a book that was apparently very much used for auguries and for divination purposes. Another very famous work where the wonder was explored is Ajaib al Mahlukat, The Wonders of Creation, which is one of my all-time favorites and some of the volumes I have had the pleasure to work with directly, as in having them in my hands. Or some other day, I'm going to bring you a, just a live stream on Ajaib al Mahlukat because these encyclopedias, because that's what they were. They were sort of an encyclopedia dealing with all sorts of creatures, and that included both real and imaginary, and they are a delight to the eyes. So that is how basically divination, we have divination through text and then we have divination through images. This divination through images, uh, if you are familiar with it, resembles a lot of the practices of tarot cards and tarot readings. Possibly they were accompanied through the way. I mean, they will be more or less the same. I don't know if tarot reading uh, sessions are done the same way these divination practices were done. I have no idea. I'm not expert. But if you know, let me know. Let's just all learn together. So now we finally get to talk. Finally, we get to talk about the Falnome. The Falnome as a book has a very distinctive structure. This is the reason I first explained text separately and then image separately. For the Falnome, mushes up together. It just brings everything together and creates another way of making divination. Um, I'm going to show you how two pages of the Falnome look like. We go. So, uh, in art history, we divide our manuscript, uh, the folios of the manuscript, the pages, they have a part which is the recto and a part which is the verso. In this case, this over here, the one with text, is the recto and this one over here is the verso. So, if you open, do I have a book with me? Yes, I do. Just hold on for a moment. Um, which book should be open? I am seeing here Patrick Rothfuss, Gilgamesh. Oh, Gilgamesh, and um, and Bar oh Frankenstein in Baghdad, oh the city of Brass. I don't know. Any any preferences, Bachar? Any book of kings? Tahog? Mm, okay, I'm gonna take this one. It's a book on manuscripts. If I don't break anything, oh, oh this is gonna be difficult. I should have thought this straight through. But the good thing is that if I mess up here, I am. Um, all good to go and all set for the Spanish live stream. Just look at these amazing people in the cave because that is how the image is called, people in the cave. Come here. The angel. I see some the angel. Well, it was, whoop, the witch king just committed suicide. No, I said city of Brass, as in B-R-A-S-S. -S. You pervert kiwi. <laughs> so, as I was saying, I'm, um, I'm going to take the image down for a moment. When we study books, uh, folios, this is a folio. Oh, <laughs> this is a folio, just a page. Okay, this is what we call a folio. And a folio has two parts. A folio has a recto, which is this part. Here we oh, this is uh, the recto over here, the one with the dragon, and this is the verso, the back. And why is that? Because uh, Persian books are read from right to left, like that. So the front part of the folio is called recto, and the back part of the folio, where the dedication is, over here, is called verso. So if you open a book randomly, you have in front of you the verso, and the recto. Okay? Is that clear? I'm gonna leave it you here. <laughs> so yeah, if I put up the image again, yes, there we go. So here you have this recto contains the text and this verso contains the image. Yeah? So when you open, yeah, there's a text and there's an image and they all together, they form the augury. When the seeker opens the book at a random page, this way there is an image on the right and a complementary text on the left. And that is how, like, all together, it's not just the image 
works by itself, although it holds the, the um, um, most, like the highest percentage of the power lies on the image, but they work together. They must be read together and interpreted together. I hope I'm making myself clear. If you don't say anything, I'm just gonna assume that I am the most amazing teacher ever existed and carry on. So, uh, yes. All right, yes, yes, let's just continue. So, the Fal Nome as a book holds an, a very interesting concept itself because it works like a talisman, like a dream, or the position of celestial bodies. They hold the power of unlocking uh, the hidden meanings of things. With the image, with this image and this augury and this text, you can see the unseen. What is that? Really? I'm back. Sorry, my computer died. I'm, I'm really sorry. We will mourn him. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is how the Fal Nome is one of the most interesting books ever created because to his pictures and his text, it was attributed the same power as a prediction that came from exactly the sky, as in the position of the stars. Uh, a talisman that was charged by magic to perform certain um, functions and the functionality and then now we have that an image an image and some verses attached to it have the same power the book is turned into a talisman itself into a source of magic and that is fantastic and impressive that is one of the reasons the Fal Names are so important and so yes, special within it but now, what does the Fal Nome say? We'll dive into the images, do not worry, but first we should attend to the text. What does the Fal Nome say? What do these texts include and how are they structured? We're going to talk about the text for a moment, even if it's, uh, if I, so I was saying before, even if it's the image, the element that holds most of the magical power, the verses accompanying it are also a matter of importance. Hello, Nukas. Let me just put up another image. Mm -hmm -hmm. Here we have it. Aha! This is the text for the augury of uh, Salih Bits the she camel from a rock. We're not going to see that picture today but that is that is where this, this would be the text that would accompany an image and the image attached to this text would be on the right. I mean, I'm, I'm pointing towards left right now, but you know, like on the side of the screen that you cannot see. The image won't be over my face, the image won't be on the other side. I think I'm explaining myself. <laughs> so basically, what do, what do the auguries tell you? Tell us, or you, the seeker. Are you seeking, Bache? <laughs> Normally, the text would include the following. First, an identification of what the image is, a statement of its meaning and its impact on the seeker. Then uh, following some religious directives we could say, yes, yeah, some religious instructions. And then generally the pronostications, the auguries could be classified generally in three. Auspicious, inauspicious and middling, meaning that they might not start at the best but they can improve. From the text, we can obtain very interesting information. By reading the answers and the way sentences are constructed, we can figure out what people asked about the most back in the day, what did indeed interest people. And here's what the scholars have gathered so far. First, people ask a lot about the feasibility to travel. If it's convenient or not convenient engaging in a travel, just make just make a look at back a tiny bit um, thought over here. Traveling back in the day was not as easy as it is today, so it implied and it caused great effort, uh, if you know what I mean. So normally you would ask for f advice if you were to start a very important, possibly long and difficult travel, uh, if your journey was going to be su successful, because you also need to think, uh, no it's not economy, it's just Kiwi, stop doing that! <laughs> I, now I lost the thread of what I was saying. God damn it. Um, that damn Kiwi. Mm, what was I saying? Oh yeah, traveling. Yeah, traveling was not like it is nowadays. It's, it was much more difficult and sometimes people did not make it. I mean, people could die in the way quite more often than uh, nowadays happens. So they wanted to be sure. They wanted to be kind of 
assured and rested that the journey was going to be possible and was going to carry on smoothly and without major incidents. Also, of course, people ask a lot about the outcomes of commercial transactions, a lot, like the economy is very important. They ask about partnerships as well, and they ask a lot about marriage, which is not surprising, at least for me. Uh, also, a common question deals with the changing of location. If it's convenient to move or not from a city to another, from one house to another, or even from another country, um, to another. Where there are many bandits at the time, it's not just bandits which they wear, but also uh, the weather is very important. Uh, making sure your supplies were, res like, were, were good and properly covered, um, having enough money to be able to rest along the way, and uh, yeah, if it was inland also. Um, Mostly, I mean, the weather is a very important, um, a very important factor to take into account because a uh, sandstorm can kill you. Uh, you could be surprised by these amazing um, water storm, like a thunderstorm. Uh, the wind, uh, the wind. If it's during the winter, the snow, or if it's during the summer, a uh, heat stroke. So like a very posh, like boom, heat wave. So yeah, there's a lot to take on the on the account. A lot. Um, Oh, also, and this is very sweet, at least to me, people ask a lot about the fate of friends or relatives whose health might be delicate, or just about friends and family in general. People want to know about the, the loved ones. Also, they ask a lot about debts or losses, normally economical, but also physical, and about receiving news from friends, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I really like this one. Keep in mind being apart, being like distant from each other on the 16th century was difficult and people could not communicate as easily as we do today so you will consult the book you will consult the father name to get to know if your friend or your relative was going to send a word soon if you're going to if you were going to hear from them because you care for them and you love them i think that is very sweet i don't think that is just fantastic <laughs> uh, also and uh, of course finally people ask about falling in love like a lot and pay attention here pay attention here because i purposely separated these two categories one thing is marriage but other is actually falling in love if you know what i mean ain't that cute you think <laughs> i think it's fantastic okay so what do text answer what is the answer they give what is the advice in return so pilgrimage is a common answer to almost every question. <laughs> Visiting sacred places, especially for Shia Muslims, constitutes a quite important part of the expression of the faith and the practice of the faith. So the book could recommend you go to Mecca or to any other religious shrine. And sometimes the answers, this is okay, this is funny. Sometimes the answers warn against people with specific physical traits like scars or certain status in too tall, too short, certain eye color. I don't know if you were aware of this, but in the one and a thousand one nights, um, the text warns the reader against people with blue eyes because those with blue eyes are not to be trusted. And I think that is fantastic because in this part of the world, everyone I know almost has greenish, bluish eyes. And uh, yeah, according to the... Uh, <laughs> if he ugly runaway girl, basically, yeah. <laughs> if, you, um, if you ever encounter a person with blue eyes, be careful because they have vice against them. They're not trustworthy, they say. Hmm. <laughs> Just leaving that, leaving that as a thought. Um, also, and interestingly enough, despite the answers being focused in the future, they could recommend taking some actions in the present. For example, if I recommend you to paint your house or to go to Mecca, they're asking for you to do something in the present. And what we can't recall from all the auguries is that they were general enough to accommodate to all social levels. Because bear in mind, not only princes and courtiers and high royal position people asked about things. No, 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 no. This practice was performed at 
every social level. Of course, the file nomads we preserve are richly illuminated and beautiful, made for kings and princes, but they were cheaper copies and also we've seen the cards and the, like the folios, separate folios in all the text and this was done in the street, like it's just on the street, that was fantastic, oh my god, it feels like. So yeah, the, the answers are general enough to, to please everybody as they cover a series of quite common concerns, political, economic, social, religious and sentimental. So yep, that is, that is basically, yeah, that's basically what this is. Haha, <laughs> Typhoon perhaps love it. Are you trustworthy, Typhoon? I think that the blue eye situation is because it's absolutely not common to see people with blue eyes in the very deep uh, Arabian plateau. Like, I don't think so. Although there are people with blue eyes all over the world. And back in the day, there were people with blue eyes all over the place too. But, you know, some traits are more common potentially <laughs> you know some features are more common in certain areas of the world um possibly if you asked if a book like a far name was written say in the very north of norway or even in the north island they would warn against people with dark hair or like dark eyes i, I don't know i'm just speaking generally so it's like yeah potentially i'm gonna say that from now on so now oh. The moment has arrived. Let's jump into the images, shall we? Do you want to see some images? Do you want to see some all glorious painted before you? I'm ecstatic! <laughs> I am ecstatic! <laughs> so, pictures! Yes, we like pictures. So, this is how we're going to do it. I have divided the images by the themes proposed by other scholars and as I explain them briefly to you, I will show you one or two examples of them and I am excited. Believe me, I cannot, I would shout, but that would be very rude and impolite, but I cannot contain loyalty. I'm happy, hello. Are the pictures behaving themselves? Yes. Yes, so far, thank you, thank you so much, pal. Uh, so far, everything's good. Um, this is because my friend here, my <laughs> there, <laughs> my friend here, the eighth historian, is also my my technical apparel and my basically um, hotline for any disasters that I perpetrate in some technological areas which is very common for me to do because i am a disaster with technology so thank you david for being there always for me thank you so much <laughs> so the biggest theme well not the biggest but one of the biggest themes in the faldome images is uh islamic tradition and this is the part where the life of prophet muhammad and his companions is represented alongside with shrines tombs and sacred places and one of the favorites to be represented is Ali and his burn in Zulfaqar and if you don't know what a Zul sorry Zulfaqar is I'm gonna show you because he's the coolest weapon you've ever seen in your life you know I normally say that I'm not a big fan of swords because I prefer weapons that date back a little bit more in the past I like swords don't get me wrong but there's um the bow and the arrow and there's the spear and there is the maze which i really like the maze but then we have the zulfaqar and the zulfaqar is this <laughs> is a sword slightly curved like a scimitar but it has these these pointy teeth like the tongue of a serpent out of it and that is the coolest sword in the entire planet. Ali was given this Zulfaqar and it was burned, it was a burn in Zulfaqar. Um, Zul means um, owner. Um, yeah, you're not a fan of swords? Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> I am a big fan of swords. Okay, I explained myself wrongly. <laughs> Excuse me, but this looks like okay, 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 okay. For those because I've seen, I, I'm receiving attacks from people that actually know me and know that just there, leaning against the wall, there are two 
salt, very beautiful. I am a very big fan of salt, yes, but I always say that Hollywood has kind of spoiled the idea of weaponry that we have about the past and we tend to believe that back in the day, and it doesn't matter where the back in the day is, it could be the 16th century, it could be the 20th century before common era, it could be, you know, the Achaemenids, the Ilkhanids, it doesn't matter. Back in the day, the most popular weapon was the sword and that was not the case. Absolutely not. All the weapons were far more popular, for example, the bow and, for example, the, um, the spear or the mace. Do you speak Turkish? No, I am afraid I do not speak Turkish. Um, maybe one day we'll learn Turkish, I don't know. But yeah, this is the Sulfagar and yeah, Ali and his Zul, uh, Zulfagar is, um, is a very, it's very common to see in the picture like that. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any picture available because um, these file nomes are very much dispersed and some of them are destroyed. But we know that Ali was represented with his uh, Zulfagar. Zulfagar, and I promise I'm gonna say, like, show you pictures of the books, but it's just, I just, I love this sword so much. And the Zulfagar, Zul uh, means owner and the, the master of some things, that, that, that holds something. And um, yeah, I just I just love it. I love the Zulfagar so much. So back, I am I'm going there. I'm going there. Um, yeah, have I told you that the Zulfagar was lit on fire? <laughs> Gonna shut up. Sorry, shut up. So, why are the the Islamic traditional images? Why are the Islamic traditions so important? They are important because they symbolize the moment the heavenly and earthly converge and meet. In these images, in this book, the sacred joins the profane, the temporal encounters the spiritual, and that is just one of the many other powers of images. As I said before, sacred uh, sacred sites. Oh, hello, David. Sorry, I'm late. That is fine, as I'm Don't worry. Um, as I said before, sacred sites and shrines are of special relevance for Shia Muslims, and seeing them in the picture transforms them into a gate. The images become a portal towards the supernatural and the heavenly. They become this eye, this window towards Al-Ghaib, the unseen, the occult, and they allow us to see into it. As I was saying before, this is, uh, I'm really happy to brought you this stream. Thank you, Patron, there, uh, because this is what I work with. I work with the images because I work professionally with the supernatural and with divination and with magic. So this is one of the reasons I'm so moved. And also uh, one of the reasons I know this topic these well and these deeply. I did my homework before, guys. So the first image I'm gonna bring you is Imam Reza, this, this, this horseback warrior is Imam Reza saving the sea people from a terrible creature which in Persian we call Div. Um, in Arabic probably they will be called Jinn but uh, yep this is this is just I'm gonna give you a few minutes to contemplate it because there's a lot going on here love the horse and the div yes isn't it the div is just represented fantastically i'm i'm gonna stick with div i'm going because I'm, I'm from iranian studies i'm gonna call it div but just tell me if it's a little bit too confusing i will switch to jinn because in this case they're synonyms so yeah this person on horseback is imam reza may i introduce you to imam reza imam reza is a descendant of the prophet muhammad and uh, the eighth imam in shia islam he lived, we think, between 766 and 818, and he is quite popular. He's quite a popular character to represent, especially from the rise of the Safavids, which were Shia. Um, battles between prophets and supernatural beings were also super popular, and most likely these scenes were inheriting the tradition of epic stories and epic encounters like the ones in the Shahnameh, for example. And by the way, as who these people, sea people are, we don't know exactly. We don't know what's going on here, actually. Sorry about that. It's just we don't know about this particular story. But most of these stories will be told um, orally and traditionally and passed from generation to generation, one, one storyteller to the next. And in this case, we don't know exactly. Atlantis, of course. <laughs> Imam Reza saving Atlantis. Is that Milo touch? Um, are that Adam and Eve in the foreground in the uh, before Imam Reza's horse? The iconography reminds me of it. There is a lot going on. 
uh, they haven't been the figures that haven't been identified but can you spot here just over here that the dude is just waving a person in this case a woman to hit Imam Reza with it <laughs> it's amazing and also I don't know can you can you spot the monkeys like in the center of there's a tree with two monkeys that are also fighting each other this image is too much. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Sorry, but we need to continue. <laughs> we need to continue here. Uh, yeah, for some, some stories, we just don't know what happened or we just ignore away. Um, are you painting demons? Uh, nope, I didn't paint. I wish I painted that one. Okay. For the next image. <laughs> is Typhoon here? Typhoon out there, baby, can you hear me? This is just for you. This is the Mirage. The beautiful Mirage that is Prophet Muhammad night journey. A striped Burak, this magnificent creature with human face. Muhammad visited the heavens and also accompanied by Jibril and he met all kinds of fantastic creatures and sacred personalities. Can you see, can you see Muhammad and Burak? Uh, Burak is the steed, is the creature uh, Muhammad is, um, is riding. Isn't it pretty? So the thing, uh, can you see the lion over here? Oh my God, my dyslexia, I'm gonna point with it. Can you see the lion over there? The thing with the lion is this have, uh, it's been doubly uh, identified. The lion you can see has been subject of two interpretations. Traditionally, he's been associated with Ali as one of his attributes and names is Azadullah, which means the lion of God, Shire Khoda in Persian. And this is because metaphorically, a lion is a person with courage. But another explanation follows the Bektlasi lore, which is uh, another uh, interpretation of, of the story, saying that the lion appeared before Muhammad and he offered his ring as a token. You know, Muhammad had a ring and he offered the ring as a token, following God's advice. And then the lion took the present and stepped back and let him pass. You can also spot Jibril, all-time favorite character of mine, leading the way, carrying the green banner. Green is a color that's also associated with paradise, with life, and with the prophet. And this, this one is Jibril over here. Can you see Jibril? Uh, why do the prophet always have their heads on fire? That is the heavenly halo. That is the fire, the sacred fire of God. That is to represent, uh, this is a sacred personality. Well spotted, Nokus. Very good spot. Um, yeah, this is Typhoon, you're there, there's a lot going on in this image, I will send that to you, it's impressive and it's beautiful, so much going on. As you see, this, these images are full, <laughs> there's a lot going on in them and it's, they are fantastically beautiful. For the third image on the Islamic tradition, we have the circuit of Kaaba. Kaaba is, uh, in the city of Mecca, is the holiest place of Islam. This is where the pilgrims go during Hajj, which is the peregrination. And you can see them praying with the hands up. Do you see them? <laughs> the hands up towards Kaaba. Uh, however, this time, the common black square, if you know something about Kaaba, that is, uh, it's a black square and quite distinctive. In this time, uh, this common black square has been transformed into a Persian tower tomb with colorful tiles adorning it. Um, can you see it? And also, can you spot the boy in the blue skirt in the middle? Can you see him over there, just in the center? Is it a boy who's knocking at the door or grabbing the handle of the door? Can you see him? This boy has been identified as Majnoon from Nezami's tale, Lelio Majnoon. Uh, on the episode, I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but there's an episode where his dad, Majnun's dad, takes him to Mecca to see if God can help cure his mad love for Laili. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. <laughs> but also, it's been suggested that this boy could be just a young dervish. It's just nobody specifically, just somebody that's there to do the pilgrimage and just to pray to. There's no him on them. I really like this one. So you can see that in these Islamic traditions, we had prophets doing 
accomplishing miraculous deeds, like um, Muhammad going to through, soaring through the, he the seven uh, heavens, uh, Imam Reza saving the sea people, and finally uh, we have shrines and sacred places, which is this one as uh, Kaaba in, in Mecca. That is for the first category of images. The spectators are awesome as always. Yes, I mean it's it's just yeah. Should I turn should I turn Merle on? I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. Or well, don't I wait? I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. Yeah, we'll cover um, the next batch, and if it's too dark, then I will turn on Merle. No, now no. <laughs> Why did I say that? Now we're moving on to Abrahamic traditions. And these include the stories of Adam and Eve, uh, uh, Musa, Yuna, Suleiman, Musa, Moses. My, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm used to the Arabic plus Persian names. Musa is Moses. Yuna is um, Jonah, you know, from Jonah and the whale. And Suleiman is well, King Solomon. And they were all very, very popular, and the tales got told repeatedly. The stories, however, are represented as a mixture of what the Quran explains, plus some traditional versions that were made popular via literature. Or perhaps they were so popular that the authors thought of including them in their accounts. In fact, they developed their own literary genre, the Qisas al anbiya or the lives of the prophets. And for the first one, I'm going to use the one I... I use for advertising the the stream. This is uh, Adam and Eve in Paradise. Everyone is here. Everyone is here celebrating Adam and Eve. Even Iblis, Satan himself. Can you spot him in the corner? Be over here. Uh, oh, whoa, here, over here, with his dark skin and covering his mouth with his hand as he is about to speak. This is this is evil. This is Satan himself. Yeah, but everybody's there, rejoicing, gathering, dancing around. Uh, okay, probably what you're wondering just now is how on earth and heaven the dragon and the peacock made it into paradise, and why are they given so much importance on this scene? Why are they there? So according to the tradition by Thalabi and Kisai, two authors who became very popular for his accounts on the lives of the prophets, the peacock and the female four-legged serpent, he represented as a she-dragon, they lived in paradise. What is that typhoon? Yes, that's the one I was thinking about before. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, the peacock and the she-dragon lived in paradise, but Iblis, being the bastard but Iblis, being the chaos generator he normally is, because Iblis, like me, is here for the chaos, he possessed the creatures and cursed them to be mortal enemies from the moment they were expelled from paradise by God and Jibril alongside Adam and Eve. But that is just, this, ima this image is impressive. It's just amazing. And another very popular character to represent is King Sulaiman, King Solomon himself. Uh, oh my god, I really like this one. I really like this image. Um, well, in case you didn't know before today, Sulaiman bought the title Sahib Qiran, that means possessor of the conjunctions, and that made him a sorcerer king. Remember that, depending on who uses magic and for what purposes, it was accepted or condemned in Islam. Make sure you check our stream on that. <laughs> Do I spot Asimur? Yes! <laughs> I, will, I will go to Asimur. Uh, Suleiman was granted the power to rule over humans, animals, birds, angels and thieves or jinns. Even the wind was under his command. He is the epitome of the perfect ruler. And this is a depiction of his court uh, with Bilqis, which is the queen also, uh, the queen of Shiva. Yes, of course. Can you see Hupu? She's super tiny. Um, can you see Hupu? If you follow my finger, Hupu is perched upon the throne of Suleiman, really close to his hand. Can you see Hupu? Who, who has that? Sandwich. R.E. Sandwich. Can you, can you see Hupu? And of course, yes, because this is a way of representing that Suleiman rules upon absolutely every single creature alive. Real, 
fantastic. There's uh, angels here, there's animals, there's Jean or Div, there is Simurg over there. I mean, I keep it wonderful plus for the queen, Queen Simurg. And there's all sorts of birds. Also, because uh, Suleiman had, um, according to the Quran, Suleiman could speak the language of the birds and communicate with them, which is one of the coolest powers ever. And I wish I had it. So, RE Sandwich, could you, could you spot Hupu? Hupu is the bird that actually brought Queen Sheba or Bilqis uh, and Suleiman together. That is a fun story, live one of the day. Solomon knew the great name, that is indeed correct. Yeah, good job. I don't know how big could you see this on your screen. I think it depends on your laptop, but in mine, because of the app I'm using, it's a little tiny, but I hope it you could be like, have like a better grasp of me. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, this, this is also beautiful images. And finally, for the Abrahamic traditions, have you guys? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a very, I'm a very big nerd. Nerd. Have you guys seen? Have you but just seen the Prince of Egypt? Every spell and jester tells you who's the best, cause you're playing with the big boys now. Playing with the big boys now, dude. I love that film. And specifically, I love this scene. This is based on a biblical story when Musa, or Moses, challenges the Pharaoh's sources by throwing his stuff before his feet. The stuff turns into a serpent and Moses' right hand, right hand, <laughs> this one, is gleaming, gleaming white. Then the sources imitate the trick, but then Musa's stuff turns into a serpent even bigger. And the creature devours all the magician snakes. Is this the film where the prince becomes a frog and that's the difference on the other side? No, I'm saying the prince of Egypt is a, it's a film about how Moses uh, took the Hebrews out of Egypt uh, from the Pharaoh. Have, am I the only one who's seen the prince of Egypt here? Am I the only one who's seen the prince of Egypt here? Is it happening? <laughs> is this happening? So basically that is what happened. And uh, yeah, Musa challenges the pharaoh's sorcerers. Um, his staff turns into a snake. Then the sorcerers imitate his uh, deed. And um, yeah, his staff, Musa's staff becomes... Uh, oh no, I love the film. Thank you, many of And the serpent is totally like, I got your back on this one. I knew you would, Anna Europa. Love you so much. So that is what the... the <laughs> Oh my god, no, definitely seen it. Of course you have, of course you guys have. In the accounts of Tabari, Thalabi and Kisai, the stuff turns in the Musa he come with me, bear with me with this one. In the accounts of these three people, the stuff of Moses doesn't turn into a serpent. It turns into a freaking dragon. And Musa's hand shines as brilliant as the sun. And Musa's dragon is not only eating the snakes, do you see that? Is eating the sorceress themselves. Bad ass. Bad ass. I love these images so much. God, I love my job. <laughs> I love my job! <laughs> Just think of it this way. You, you're you writing all the lives of the prophets and oh yeah, there's a very this very cool episode in where a snake, a staff turns into a snake, sorry. And yeah, that is cool enough, but what if it was not a snake? What if it was a freaking dragon? Persia just Persia and Arabia just upgrade absolutely everything they touch upon. I love dragons so much. They're part of my thesis actually. Oh yeah, I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna take it. Bye Musa. Bye Musa, my honey. I'm gonna turn Mul on now. Alright. Whoa! Okay, that good? Appears good. Oh my god, please, can you recommend any books about this topic later? It is awesome. You mean the dragon and Musa and... Uh, and uh, uh, what do you mean exactly, Typhoon, my dear? You can take advantage of our friendship. All right, so that was, uh, we call it, uh, Abrahamic traditions. Now we turn into a very interesting part as well, which is scatological themes. What is scatological? Anything that has remotely to do with the hereafter, the thereafter, the other side. 
right here, right now. I pull the off rod. Pete, is that you? <laughs> That's just a friend. Um, so what is represented here? Hell, heaven, the day of judgment, the arrival of the Antichrist, all of them were also super popular. And as mentioned before, people enjoyed the supernatural and it experienced a revival during the 15th century with all these magical encyclopedias going around and these kind of divinatory practices being so popular. Yes, about the dragon, but also about Falnomés in general. So there's a book called Falnomé, the Book of Omens, which... Uh, it's, it's, I don't remember the author, but it's called like that, Falname, the Book of Omens, and uh, I would recommend that for starts, and then just going from there to the bibliography. I will, I will email you, the, um, either email you or send you the, the link, Typhoon, do not worry. So yeah, the eschatological themes, uh, they're very popular, and yes, I said the Antichrist because in Islam, the Antichrist appears. Look at this beauty. Ta-da! <laughs> that is not the Antichrist, though. It's not the Antichrist. Um, this fella, this character over here, is uh, the Bat al-Ard, the beast of the earth, one of the signs of the imminent arrival of the apocalypse. It was described as a horned beast with the head of an ox, lot in size, and the eyes of a boar, and the skin color of a tiger. This image however took some of the accounts from the official description you can see the artist clearly added creative treats like the fangs the wings or the coated chest in blue plumes yes from sir Pilot, yes but we don't have it in vienna ah thank you i will try and look it up for you because that is a very very nice book i mean i, I really enjoyed working with it so yeah this is the bat al arz the beast off of the earth and this could also be one of your omens because i don't know if you remember butcher but all these images would be in the book and they will accompany uh, a text and you would ask a question to the book and whatever these images revealed will be your destiny and chicken my love <laughs> uh, also i didn't say this before but these images are from different books sometimes they do belong into the same book but not all of them. Do not think that all of the, the images I am putting up uh, come from the same album or from the same book. They're actually not. There's a lot of folios that are also dispersed and kept in museums separately. But we've been able to track them down and know that they are they used to belong to one Falnome. Sorry, but the horrors remind me of an insect somehow. Big Kafkas. Actually, yeah, they look like antlers. More to me, like a reindeer. Like um, deer, a moose. I don't know. I have no. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. He needs knee replacement surgery. Oh my god. <laughs> Who said that? Kush cakes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, he does need do need some knee surgery right now. Have you seen the elbows? Have you seen the elbows? <laughs> oh my god. Mm -hmm. Well. Oh my god. This has to be one of my favorite depictions of hell ever. Butcher, this is hell. And why is this? Why is the reason uh, for me liking this so much? This is because they included the Zagum tree as the main protagonist. A nice metal AF. The Zakum tree was said to grow at the bottom of hell itself. Its fruits burned the sinner's bellies like molten brass. The pain! And the only remedy to it was to be washed with boiling water. So that meant a longer agony. <coughs> and that is badass as hell! <laughs> I love this image of hell so, so much. It is fantastic. How do you come up with a tree such as a, as a gum tree? How do you do that? I just, it's perfect. But on the other hand, you know, the other side of the coin is paradise, which here is represented as a very beautiful garden. Can you see the palm grenades? The palm grenades symbolize life and eternity. I don't know what's happening, but I hope you're having a nice day. Cheers from a Brazilian fighting for social democracy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the cheers, Super Teddy guy. Was that? Samuel, hi, beautiful lady. Oh, Azizam, you know how to talk to me always. 
I see you on Thursday. My English is too bad. Your level is impossible for me. Sorry. I hope you have a good night. But that was a very well constructed sentences. Oh, thank you so much, someone. And don't worry, we'll see each other on Thursday. That is happening too. Um, like getting stoned by a jelly and having to appeal. Yes, more or less, I think is worse the remedy than the actual, yeah. Um, so I was saying, oh yeah, on the opposite, we have paradise. And can you see the palm grenades? They are symbols for life and eternity. And this is a representation of delight, of happiness, of safety, uh, with musicians and trees and pavilions. Isn't this beautiful? This is truly a heavenly sight because, yeah, of course we have hell, but we have paradise in it. So this, uh, this is for, can you still, guys, can you still see me? And hear me and everything's good because my app is sending messages you know that from time to time uh, tweet sends me messages so uh, is all good is still all good I carry on with it so that was for yep okay fantastic that's uh, that's all about um, the scatological tradition and there we move into another topic that was also super popular which uh, the um, the scholars have titled sages, heroes, and villains. And uh, yeah, yeah, okay, fantastic. If you know something about Iran and its production of books, is that they love epic stories. The many illustrated volumes of the Shahnameh are proof of that. And of course, among the pages of the Falnameh, sages, heroes, and villains had their representation. Eskandar, yes, that is our old friend Alexander the Great, is among the most illustrated heroes. He was apparently greatly deemed at the time, but also because he was associated with Zul Qarnain, the two-horned, a king who had traveled to the very end of the earth itself and see beyond its limits badass but also uh, sages and physicians uh, found their place in these pages too oh my gosh can i get can i get a bow for the queen the absolute ruler of the heavens I mean, of course, I could not bring you, I could not not bring you this, this image of Simur herself. Look at the beauty of her. I'm just in awe. I'm, I'm really, really in So this is a person, the, the person she's writing, uh, he's called Mugrat for the Arabic and the Persian, but he's Hippocrates. If you know Hippocrates, he was one of the most reverent and appreciated physicians in the um, it's so right yeah <laughs> it is beautiful um this uh, as i was saying he, this is a uh, hippocrates writing simul hippocrates uh did i say this already yeah he was revered as one of the greatest physicians from antiquity and he's called uh, he's called Bukrat. and and why is he writing simul what's he doing with her this is because simul she is a symbol for wisdom and for medicine the text says uh, the Oguri text says they are heading to Mount Gaf in the search for a treatment. This mountain, this sacred mountain, was a place so important and so heavenly, only Simur could reach it. And she carried the ancient physician with her so he could obtain the knowledge she possessed. There is so much to say about this, but we need to carry on. Just look, just look at the colors of it, look at the composition, it's emanating power this is one of my favorite simurgs ever just so cool just so cool and this image over here is darius the <laughs> third dying in the arms of his half brother excander aka alexander the great Yes, you hear me well. No, I am not making anything up. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's the image. Uh, Eskandar and uh, Eskandar is down there, uh, coat in a blue coat and with a very big crown. I don't know if you can see him. And then Dara, at least the dying Dara, is the agonizing man in his lap. 
again, I'm not making up things. You didn't hear me wrong. Yes, this is uh, Alexander the Great with his half-brother. And this is because according... Uh, it looks really amazing, I love it. <laughs> according to the Shahnameh, Dara and Eskandar were half-brothers, both having the Persian ruler Darab as a father. They didn't know uh, they were brothers and they engaged in war. But long story short, Dara ended up killed by two of his counselors, who actually you can see hanging in the back. Can you see them on the top, hanging there, above? They've been, they've been basically they've been executed, and um, everybody's mourning the death of the Persian king, including Eskandar, which is very sweet. Isn't sweet? Isn't it sweet the way he's holding the head of his dead half brother? This is a very nice image. Yeah. And very detailed, of course, all these images were super detailed. Okay, and we came finally to the, well, finally, we come to the final category, which are planets and stars. Heavenly bodies and horoscopes are the most popular depictions of the phenomenon. The tradition of illustrated bird charts, birth charts, sorry, planispheres, and all sorts of objects with representations of the zodiac, um, they are all extremely popular in Iran. There are some positive planets like the Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter, and yes, at the time, yes, oh, I'm really happy you stayed till the end because I knew, no, because yeah, I put one of the images, if one of the images was for Typhoon, one of the common images is for you. Um, uh, Moon and Sun were considered planets too, as in celestial bodies is the name, the, the category they fall under. So yeah, the, pos the positive planets were the Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus and Jupiter. But also there were negative planets like Mars and Saturn. Moon moons! <laughs> so, here is the, this is the celestial sphere, Nukas, this goes for you. Here we have the seven planets and the 12 zodiac signs, all integrated into a celestial disk, held by angels in position. The character in the center is Saturn, the furthest planet from Earth and also the one with the most negative influence. Saturn was feared and terrible. So in order here, uh, so you see, do you guys see Saturn in the center, this old man? So in order, can you guys see in the outer ring, in the middle outer ring, could you see a face? And the face, uh, the background of the face is yellow, just, just the face. That one is the moon. And if we move clockwise, we have the moon. Mercury represented as a scribe. Uh, Venus represented as a harpist, then the sun. Then we have Mars, coated as a warrior. And finally we have Jupiter as a judge. Isn't this the coolest ever? And in the outer outer ring we have the signs of the zodiac. Um, you can see from over here, uh, can you see this one? No? Yes? <laughs> from over here this is a uh, Capricorn and then we have uh, yeah, this, this over here is Capricorn and then we have uh, Pisces, uh, sorry, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, uh, Cancer, Leo, uh, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio and finally um, over here, the coolest one and because it's mine, <laughs> Sagittarius. Uh, Jupiter is definitely the majestic judge. Yes, it is. He's judging. He's always judging, isn't he? <laughs> so yeah, all of those are the, the signs of the zodiac. And as I said before, all the universe, the cosmos, is held in place by angels. Meaning that in the end, even the universe exists, is a creation of God, and it should be revered because it's majestic. And finally, the last image we're going to see today is planet Mars. Da -na 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 -na, the red planet. Yes, 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 yes. So this is a representation of Mars. Like in Greek or Roman mythology, it was a warrior and was associated with color red for his proximity to the sun. 
This is the fifth planet in ascending order in Islamic astrology and traditionally is depicted as a fierce warrior riding into battle. In this case, even riding a supernatural beast that resembles a lot the Chilin from, from China, otherwise called Kirin. And he appears holding a lot of symbols. The severed head dripping blood and the sword, which are the most characteristic one. Um, yes, yes, like a shrunken head. No, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it was shrunk. So they, they emphasize Mars's uh, warrior-like personality. Then the brazier, like the, the burning brazier, represents the planet's association with fire and heat. The crown emphasizes Mars's power, and then we have represented the two domiciles of Mars. A domicile or a house in the zodiac is uh, sorry, a domicile or a house is a zodiac symbol the planet has influence or rule over. In this case, we have Cancer represented as a black scorpion. Can you can you see Cancer, the black scorpion? Oh, actually, I caught the image in that that tail. Can you see the tail of the of the scorpion? He's he's holding that, and then Aries is the other one who has um, a rule over. But this apparently has been substituted by this magnificent beast, and also emphasizes Mars's physical power. To Mars, so was Mars associated with red because of blood, possibly. Yes, I mean, Mars has always been, in, uh, like, from Greek or Roman mythology, he's been a warrior like creature. So, yeah, most likely he was associated with um, red, heat, war, and because of that, bloodshed. This is, uh, this is it. Say goodbye, Mars. It's been a pleasure having you here. So, but ciao! This is it for today. This was the stream on the Farname on the Book of Omens. So what we can bring as a conclusion here is that images, and I am saying this in as an art historian, <laughs> images have power. Images have the power to compel people to do things, and the Falnome books is the true evidence of books and bibliomancy being, first of all, extremely popular. I've said that throughout the whole stream, but also they held magic in themselves. They were considered powerful and gorgeous. These images, remember, would be accompanied by an augury and uh, with uh, some advices. So just imagine the practice of this in your daily life. I am literally mind blown. And uh, yeah, this, I'm really happy that I could um, show you a little bit of what I do, because this is part of my research. This is part of my actual job. Yes, I cannot believe I said that, but I work with dragons and all the supernatural creatures. And this is part of what I do. So thank you so much for joining me today. I am happy that you say oh my god this be this has been a long stream but i'm very happy you stick around and uh, yeah that you learned a little bit more about the fall nome and the book of omens and the art of making magic and divination through books it's been my greatest greatest pleasure having you all here but ciao and you know the real thank you so much to all my patrons if you want to consider supporting us head over to las plumas de simur slash Patreon.com is after Patreon. There's no one driving here. <laughs> the beautiful, lovely astral images and the other, especially the blue Simur image, was my favorite. Ah, uh, yeah, Simur is also my favorite, but also my second favorite has to be Musa confronting the sources uh, from the Pharaoh and, you know, the staff becoming a freaking dragon and devouring people. Just why not? <laughs> But yeah, it's been my greatest pleasure. Uh, thank you to my patrons as always. And thank you to all the people who's new here. And welcome to everybody who's followed and subscribed. And yeah, I will see you guys uh, next week if all is good. And yeah, if you want to check on my social media as I'm away, that is also something you could do. And yeah, guys, my dearest, dearest bacho, it's been my fantastic pleasure. And you know, um, I hope you have a fantastic week and until we see each other next time, remember, create, explore and have fun. See you next time.